Hello again, and welcome to This Week in Triathlon, your one-stop shop for triathlon news, races, gossip, gear, and training. We're your hosts, Kevin, in Folsom, California, and Andreas in Berkeley. Uh, today is January 20th, and while most of the country is still in a deep freeze, things are finally starting to heat up in the triathlon world. But uh, before we d uh, dive in uh, for this episode, uh, how you doing, Andreas? I'm doing good, Kevin. Uh, we're, uh, we're not quite freezing down here, but... Um... But yeah, so I'm I'm doing really well. Um, hope you are as well. And uh, I'm excited to uh, talk a little bit about what's been going on over the last uh, week or so. Well, I, I know we both live in, uh, in in Northern California. Things are great right now. But I, I, I my my trip to Chicago last week confirmed that things are still in a deep freeze. And uh, when I was coming back from Chicago last Friday, uh, I have a little work apartment off Michigan Avenue. I go to the trash chute. I had my winter gloves and my hat in one hand. I go to the trash chute to throw out my trash before I, I take off for the airport. I threw out my gloves and my hat with the trash. So uh, I had a little bit of a chilly walk to uh, the public transit, and uh, you know, I was glad to get home to, to California. Wait, you didn't you didn't pick up your uh, your gloves and hat? You just let them stay in the trash? What's, what's well, the it's, a, it's a 40-story building, so you throw the chute down, and um, I had some really nice down gloves. Um, so I was thinking, oh my god, I just threw my, my really nice you know, REI down gloves down the chute. And I go down to the front desk, and um, I was fortunate enough to, I was able to get to the trash chute and find the gloves, uh, but the hat I uh, was too covered in uh, some kind of disgusting substance. <laughs> I, I just let that one go. So. Yeah, well, I think the moral of the story is um, we're, we're, we're lucky to be living in California where we don't have those, uh, those kinds of problems, if you will. Yeah, well, well, let's get to uh, this week's uh, this content. Um, this week in uh, this week in triathlon, we're going to discuss Cervelo's newly revised uh, P2, one of the most popular bikes. We're going to talk briefly about Auckland 70.3. We're going to talk what's better for indoor cycling, rollers versus a trainer, and uh, we're also going to talk uh, briefly about uh, NCAA's decision to add uh, triathlon as a women's uh, test sport. Uh, but before we jump into that, we're going we're gonna to talk about the news that has uh, the Northern California triathlon community talking this week, which is, of course, uh, one of our favorite subjects to talk about anything competing against Ironman, which is you know, often Challenge. Well, Challenge last week uh, released uh, news that they're going to be hosting a new race in uh, 2014, which is going to be uh, Challenge Rancho Cordova. Which I thought was a joke when you first Yeah, well, uh, for it. most people, they, they may not know what that is. Well, Rancho Cordova is, is literally Yeah, yeah. My and, and most people don't know where that is. Yeah, the, 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 swim, uh, the swim for the, the, the race will actually be about a mile from my, my front door. So about and this will be about an hour and a half. Uh, yeah, so hours. you're excited about that. Oh, absolutely. But, but you know, go, going back to... Um, to the, the announcement and, and just people's reactions, you know, I, I, I tend to think more and more that, that people are just, they just want to do a good race that's convenient to them because uh, here you have a challenge race which has a really nice reputation um, and people were upset that it wasn't, you know, somewhere else. It's, you know, it's, you can't, you know, you, you can't have everything. If, if you want a, a good race that competes against Ironman, um, you know, that there's only a certain number of places where that can happen, and uh, so yeah, it's sort of a, a little bit of a bizarre uh, reaction to the to the announcement. But I think you've said it, and I I've said it. Uh, we're excited. Uh, Northern California is just just becoming this really really uh, destination um, for for, uh, for 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 triathlon. I mean, there's just so many options around here. Yeah, and for uh, for you know, obviously this this race will serve uh, the, the the Northern California market uh, with with close markets being San Francisco, Sacramento. Um, there'll be a, if you're coming from out of town, there'll be a lot of airport options. You can fly into Sacramento, you can fly into Oakland, uh, and have a, a relatively short drive. Um, this is going to be an extremely convenient uh, race to be able to compete in. There are plenty of hotels close by. This isn't going to be like a wildflower. Uh, we're not going to be camping out. Uh, in uh, in Paso Robles, unfortunately, so uh, well or fortunately, but I, I'll be I'll be staying at my house. Uh, I'll surely uh, host some athletes uh, for a homestay with my wife and I. Um, just to talk about the course real quick, this will be an urban uh, race uh, environment at least for the start. Uh, the swim is going to be great. Um, this is actually one of my favorite swim venues. Uh, it'll be in Lake Natomas, which is it's a pretty actually cold body of water even for October. Um, 
the, the temperature in, uh, in, in this area gets you know, well over 100, even in September. Um, so water in the 50s and 60s, you wouldn't think you'd actually have that, but, but the water in Lake Natomas can get pretty cold because all the water is coming out of the bottom of Folsom Lake. It drains into Lake Natomas, and um, the, the, it's all held back by the Nimbus Dam. So that's where the race is going to start. It should, our, our, the people that will be competing in the race can expect to have a very, very smooth uh, swim. Um, this body of water is really well protected from, uh, from the wind. And this is actually one of the, this body of water is actually one of the best rowing lakes for competitive uh, rowing in the country. So, uh, you know, participants can expect to have extremely smooth swimming. When athletes get out of the water after the 1.2 mile swim, uh, they're going to head out on uh, a really, really flat, mostly flat bike with some rollers, um, but it's going to be pretty flat. It's going to be very, very fast. And um, the, the race course actually heads into Folsom for a little bit before uh, jumping south into uh, the ranch land. Um, it's, it's, it's actually pretty barren out there um, all the way down to Rancho Marietta and back up towards, uh, towards Sacramento. Uh, it will be a one-loop bike, and um, our, the racers can expect to have uh, pretty safe roads, pretty smooth roads. And the first half of the bike will actually be quite scenic. It's, it's a pretty nice part of Sacramento. Uh, it's very flat, very fast. And then as athletes head, come in from their 56-mile bike, uh, it'll be more of an urban uh, environment, kind of more of an industrial area the last 10 miles or so before they get into Rancho Cordova. Athletes will ditch their bikes. Uh, and uh, this is where the race organizers kind of threw me for a loop because I was wondering, you know, for an area that has so many great areas to, uh, to, to train uh, and potentially host a race, um, I'm not sure why they would uh, pick the industrial corridor of Rancho Cordova for a, for a half marathon. I, I completely agree, and, and that's the point that I was going to make, is it, the, the, the race start and, and finish is actually transition one and two, which is it's a point-to-point -point race, so you're going to dismount your bike uh, at a different place where you actually um, transition from the swim onto the bike. So it... By looking at the map, it's actually not that far from the um, from the American River uh, Parkway or, or or path, whatever it's called, uh, which runs along the the American River in, in Sacramento. So I, you know, I, I would have liked to see some sort of race course that goes along that or incorporates that. But um, as the website describes it, it, it goes along some. Uh, I can't remember exactly the wording that they use, but some office parks, and 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 it's that that's the only. Uh, question mark I, I have about the whole deal. And these aren't office parks like uh, like you know Cupertino or Mountain View. This this is like you know old school work park. So this won't be a, this won't be a scenic run. Um, I'm gonna go out with a GoPro once my GoPro uh, gets delivered to me. Uh, hopefully by late this week I'm gonna go out there. I'm gonna take video of uh, the swim, the bike, and, and the run. Um, I'm not actually looking forward to going down there for the run because it's not that nice of an area. My wife who works in the waste and industry, uh, recycling business. That's actually where they're based. So uh, those are the kind of companies you're going to be running around, you know, garbage companies. <laughs> All I can think of is um, the uh, the company uh, from the office. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but that that's just I remember. I, I, all I think of is is their little town and, and where they're located and just running alongside uh, areas like that. But yeah. but you know beggars can't be choosers. We want alternatives. We want races aside from just the M dot type stuff. And and this is one that's got a great name to it. And the location's convenient both for for you and I. I mean, um, so so really I, I'm not complaining. But here here's the genius uh, move um, it, for 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 challenge uh, for the athletes heading over to Kona. Um, this is kind of a good last stop, really, uh, for athletes who want, want to have a really close 70.3 just before the race. They can compete. Or also, you know, athletes from around the world that will be heading over there just to watch. Um, you know, for instance, Belinda Granger, um, she is a, a challenge athlete, does a lot of challenge races. I'm not sure if she's going to be racing Kona next year. Probably not. Uh, but she's already committed, at least on Twitter, that, you know, she's going to be racing. Um, Emily Cox, who's a professional athlete over in uh, Napa Valley, uh, I'm sure she'll come over for this race, and um, all the athletes that are, you know, there's so many pros and serious triathletes in Northern California that I think there's going to be some good turnout for this race, despite the course. I think it's a great time of year, and um, the swim and the bike will be great. The run, you know, we'll get through it, but uh, this is this is this will be an inter interesting race, and I have to thank you know Challenge for for you know literally bringing a race to me. You know, you don't get that that you don't get that luxury too often. Well, I don't think they did. They brought it to you specifically. I just think it, it happened to uh, to work out that way. Um, but uh, but don't don't uh, don't get so excited uh, 
and and picture these guys in, in a boardroom uh, thinking, okay, where are we going to take our next race? Well, how about we take it to uh, Mr. Tedonio over in Northern California? But uh, but I, I guess I guess we get your point, and um, you know. To, to the other point that you made about the pros, it, it's actually a race that's going to pay out fairly decently. I, I think the, the first place for male and female are going to be 5500 bucks, which, you know, for a 70.3, I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty average. Um, it's, um, it's not the best, but, but it's a good alternative. And, um, yeah, so, so that's not bad. No, and um, no. Actually, contrary to what you just said, uh, Felix, um, the, the owner of the, from Family uh, Challenge, uh, I actually sent him a text and, and said, "Felix, you know what can you do for me? Uh, get a race in my backyard." And he said, "Yeah, I'll see what I can do. No big deal. Just come race Challenge Roth, and I'll hook it up." And he did. So thank you, Felix. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, anyways. Um, you know, it, it'll be a good race. Uh, our athletes that are interested in signing up can sign up starting uh, Friday, and the race will be in uh, October. So, uh, you know, it should be a good one. But uh, moving on, Andreas, uh, NCAA, um, big news this week. Um, NCAA, uh, you actually brought this up to me. This isn't something I saw. You saw this one first. Uh, NCAA has uh, announced that at least for uh, for women's, uh, they're gonna, you know, for it's gonna be a Division One sport. Triathlon is gonna be a Division One. They classify it as an, an emerging sport, um, but this is actually big news. Yeah, and you know, it, we like to think of it as 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 triathletes, as as people that that follow the sport. We're we're excited about it because we think of it as as maybe getting some more attention. But this is strictly a, a Title Nine uh, type of move where. Um, they need to uh, make things a little bit more equal between the money spent on women's sports and the, the money spent on, on men's sports. Uh, obviously, men's sports draw most of the money, and, and football and basketball end up subsidizing a lot of the other collegiate sports. Um, so, it, it, you know, it's before we get too excited about it, that's, essentially that's what it is. But nonetheless, they probably could have picked a number of other sports, and they've, they've gone with, with triathlon. So, um, and not only will it be... A Division One uh, collegiate sport, but it'll it'll be also the uh, NCAA Division Two and Division Three approved it as well. Uh, so it's going to be across the board. Uh, they'll be able to offer athletic scholarships, um, and teams uh, and schools can start fielding teams starting for the fall of 2014, which actually seems uh, pretty quick uh, for for a sport that was just announced. Um, but there's a lot of questions that I have. Uh, I'm excited, but you know, the, I, I think the consensus is uh, this is just going to be a, a women's thing. Uh, don't count on ever seeing the, the men's uh, get a, a triathlon uh, team at, at the NCAA collegiate uh, Division One level. Well, I, I actually, I'm, I'm actually pretty excited about that. Um, the, the reasons for uh, I'll tell you in a second, but uh, just to, just to describe what an emerging sport classification is, um, if 40 schools Add triathlon uh, as a women's uh, sport within the ten year next ten years. Um, triathlon will be given uh, full varsity status, and uh, there there have been a, a couple sports that have kind of gone through that pathway. For instance, ice hockey, water polo, and rowing have all kind of come through the emerging sport to varsity sport classification. So I think, as particularly on the East Coast and uh, on the, in the South, I think this sport will kind of catch on. And um, triathlon has existed as a as a club sport for years. And it's pretty popular in Colorado and California, particularly in the West. Um, but here's the reason why I'm excited about this this sport, and that it's really the, because it's gonna it's gonna give more support to uh, kind of the pool of talent coming up and through. So a lot of people complain that why isn't the United States competitive on a national international level? Um, you know, with, with countries like uh, England or Australia. Well, th these countries you know have a tremendous amount of support, and they identify talent early. Um, so, you know, in, in countries like Australia, they have like their, their Olympic teams, but they also have like kind of their institutes of sports that identify talent really young and give financial support, coaching support, accommodations, you know, line them up with gear, and they find that talent early and kind of nurse it along. And, um, you know, with that, that, with that quantity comes quality. Um, so they, they, they get a pool young, and, and as, as they kind of move up through the ranks, they get support. So it's kind of not unlike what happened to American running in the last 15 years, where you know, 15, 10, 15 years ago, American distance running was absolutely pathetic for a country of 300 million people. 
And now you look at Galen Rupp, who last week had the seventh fastest 5,000 meter time indoors just last week. And I think the reason for that success in distance running, there have been other uh, good distance runners kind of coming up, is that you know, um, you know, the collegiate system, the high school system, and the post collegiate system have all vastly improved. So they've been able to kind of nurse that talent along. And uh, now you're starting to see Americans, you know, competing on the international level. Well, I, I think there's lots of things to be excited about. Uh, don't get me wrong. I, you know, I, I think um, a lot of people uh, may misinterpret it as, as, you know, the NCAA is, is looking to add a, a women's triathlon, and, and soon after that will come men's triathlon, which, you know, I'm, I'm all about just having one form of triathlon versus zero form of triathlon in, in the NCAA. So I, I think that's great. I, I agree with you that it's only going to help uh, further along the, uh, the U.S. progress uh, within the sport and um, just how competitive they are with, with, with countries like Australia, like the U.K. Um, so I, I think that's great. I, you talked about the popularity of, of triathlon right now, and, and it, it is quite popular. I, I don't know that when hockey was, um, was being considered an, an emerging sport, they had as much popularity as, as triathlon. I, I, I was reading somewhere that they have over uh, 200 uh, universities with, with club programs. So um, that's a lot, you know, and, and I, you know, I, I can't imagine that there won't be 40 institutions that incorporate uh, triathlon into as a varsity sport um, in the next 10 years. Right. So, well, well, when triathlon does become a varsity sport, uh, maybe some of those athletes uh, will will wonder uh, for indoor cycling, what's best, uh, rollers or a trainer? So that's uh, my my pathetic attempt at a segue into our next subject, uh, <laughs> which is what's better for indoor training. Um, we're just coming out of the winter season. Actually, uh, we're you know we're still in the winter season, but I myself I, I like to ride indoors quite often. Um, I'm not sure about you, Andreas. No. Nope. Well, I, there are a lot of athletes, uh, triathletes, uh, that, that like to ride indoors, and um, the kind of the, I think that what what started you know years ago was was rollers. Um, you know, it's very simple technology. I actually have a set of rollers here uh, with me. I have a, a set of um, of Freightware rollers. Um, these are uh, two point two five inch rollers, um, and you know, as a pretty serious triathlete, I actually never ridden rollers. Period. Ever. Uh, until uh, just about you know two months ago when I when I first ordered these, and um, the reason I, I, I got these was um, I already had a trainer, and um, I was just looking for something with more of a, a little bit more of like a road feel experience, and um, you know these are actually fantastic. Um, I, I don't have a very smooth pedal stroke I found out, and um, you know if you've never have you ever ridden rollers, Andreas? I've tried, yeah. I, I mean, it's it's not easy, easy by any stretch of the imagination, and, and, and like you said, it for your pedal stroke, it's it's fantastic, um, but it, it's it's hard and it takes a little getting used to. Yeah, so so it's hard to balance. There's nothing actually holding you on onto the the mechanism. You actually spin on these rollers, and, and the wheel is just the centrifugal motion. You know, basically, you have to balance and to stay on these rollers. Um, these are Kreitler. Uh, this is kind of the, the gold standard. Uh, there's some, you know, some more expensive rollers, some cheaper ones, uh, but this is probably the most ubiqui ubiquitous. They come in different uh, sizes, um, so you can get more or less resistance. You can hook up flywheels to them, and uh, they're extremely quiet, which is what I like about them. They're also very portable. They're really light. Um, you know, this probably weighs about 15 pounds versus my, my 50 pound trainer I'm going to show you in a second. Um, you know, if I had to pick between, you know, either, you know, if I could ride only exclusively on rollers or a trainer, I'd probably pick a trainer. Um, but just to have something that I can work on, my, my pedal stroke, my balance, um, you know, because I like to ride indoors so much, you've ridden with me, Andreas, and I have pretty poor descending skills. And what... <laughs> I, I, you know, it... It's, it, it's not that you have poor descending skills. I mean, it, it's... It, it's not, you know, going down a mountain is um, is is not the easiest. So I, I wouldn't, you know, I cut yourself some some slack. But uh, but then again, to that point, um, the rollers don't help much with that. I, I think they do help with with the other things that, that you mentioned, which is uh, pedal stroke is just a fantastic way to improve your pedal stroke. Um, no, no, I, and, I, no, I have to cut you off. I totally disagree. Uh, I think this. What, what you have to do on rollers is you actually have to really rel you know relax to be able to balance. And you know one of my problems when I, I descend is I, I get all tight 
you know, and like kind of nervous, like I'm going to crash or something. When you get tight, you know, the input in your steering kind of changes, and, and it's hard to move around your weight. So, you know, if you can relax, you know, that's one, one of like the, the number one recommendations you see when you're trying to, you know, improve your descending is just kind of relax. Um, so, you know, riding the I mean, roll. You're still, you're still going down uh, a mountain at, at, you know, 60K an hour or, or you know, 35 miles an hour, and, you know, it, it's different. I, I mean, I, listen, I whatever works is, is great, but I, I think ultimately – the best option is to balance between riding indoors and riding outdoors. There's nothing better than actually riding outdoors. Yeah, but you know, you know, in a couple of years when Chris and I have kids, and if I'm doing the the stay-at-home dad gig, um, you know, it'll be pretty nice to be able to kind of throw on the, the the rollers, have the baby in the crib, and you know, these things don't make too much noise, and I, you know, I can, you know, it'll be it'll be a nice alternative than you know. Leaving my maybe baby you can start working on some tricks. You know, if you go to Interbike, uh, multiple companies that that sell rollers, you always see them, you know, um, with some sort of guy or, or girl on their bike hopping on and off and, and doing all these crazy things. It's just beyond me, uh, which is pretty incredible. But, um, but um, and, and you, you do have uh, a trainer as well, which I think you use the, the Le Mans, um Revolution trainer, correct? Yeah, this is, um, this, is a, uh, this thing is a beast that weighs about you know, 45, 50 pounds. Um, this is a really nice alternative to uh, most trainers where you actually set up your rear wheel. Um, you actually mount your chain to the cassette on this, and it's got a great kind of uh, kind of um, you know kind of gradual increase in in uh, in resistance. Um, so it's kind of a nat more natural kind of power band, if you will. Um, it's very loud, uh, which is probably my biggest complaint about this. So you know, if I'm if I'm trying to listen to music or watch a movie, this is extremely loud. And um, it, you know, if I'm you know one thing that you know helps with you know riding a trainer or is trying to watch something, trying to listen to something. And with this, it's just kind of like this mind-numbing hum, which is, you know, sometimes it's cathartic, but if you're trying to, you know, have a conversation with someone that's, you know, in the room while you're on the bike or other people are on the bikes, if you have a couple of them together or listen to a coach, um, it's, it's almost deafening. Um, but, uh, you know, you know, Wahoo Fitness, uh, they have one that's similar to this. It's about twice the price of this, if not more. Um, I've heard that's a little bit quieter. Um, and I know Lamont is working to kind of try to quiet this thing down. Um, but, you know, Greg LeMond used something like this, you know, back in his cycling days, not as, you know, polished, but, you know, I, apparently that's how he got the idea for this, is that someone built him something like this um, back when he was a, a professional cyclist. Well, and, and the good thing about the trainer that you're holding up right now is, is yes, it's, it's quite loud, but it also gives you a, a really good uh, feel for, for uh, when you're pedaling versus a lot of these uh, fluid and, and um, the other traditional trainers, uh, they can, you know, they, they, they can uh, be a little bit more pulsy, if, if that makes sense, when you're pedaling and not as smooth. Um, so I guess you take the good with the bad, but, you know, somebody in your position where they have the rollers and the trainers um, and obviously beautiful weather uh, in California, you, you've probably got zero excuses as to, uh, as to why you're not getting on your bike one way or another. Yeah, well, you know, the, one of the downsides about this is that you have to actually, like, kind of mount it. It takes about, you know, five minutes. Your hands get dirty. Um, with the rollers, you just throw your bike on. You don't need to, you know, change any tires or anything like that. It's, you know, that's that's my, my you know, with my road bike, I, I prefer to ride my, my, ride my road bike most of the time. And, you know, before I go out for a ride, if I want to warm up, I can throw them on the rollers. If I'm waiting for someone and uh, kind of get a nice little warm up um, before, you know, instead of trying to switch, you know, you know, my, my bike on and off this beast. But um, I like the trainer, you know, when, I'm, when I have like a, a long workout and I can just kind of get it, you know, I'm, I, I'm not even going to try to ride my, my tri bike or a TT bike on the rollers. Um, but on the trainer, you know, you can throw a towel over your head, zone out, and, you know, crush it. Whereas on the rollers, you have to be paying 110% attention. Otherwise, you're going to fall off and, you know, hurt yourself. So if somebody's got just one option or they can only just get one of them, um, what should they get? They should get a direct mount, just like this trainer. Um, that's that's their you know if you if you can only do one that's, but I think in an ideal world you have both. Okay. Well, you know it's um, it's uh, it, it's it's certainly a, a a good way to train um, in the colder months and like you said even even when you have nice weather it's just good for for um, for doing some of your your 
workouts or if you don't feel like going outside. Yeah, and, who, and, and you know, triathletes are notorious for having, you know, poor pedaling mechanics. So for kind of building, if you want to kind of turn over every single rock uh, and try to improve, you know, even incrementally, I think that uh, having the rollers can really help. Cool. All right, so we got a, a couple things briefly we can touch upon. Um, Cervelo, uh, Andreas, you've seen uh, probably their, their new P2 they kind of came out with. Yeah, so I, I think what you're seeing is just the technology trickling down. Um, I didn't spend too much time looking into the specifics, but, you know, it's just a trickle down from the P5 to the P3 to now the new P2, and, and that P2, I want to say, was seven, eight, nine years old, and um, while it was still selling quite well, I, I think it was it was a welcome change. Um, the geometry, again, with, with what they've been doing went a little bit, uh, more towards the tall and narrow, even more so than the P2 used to be, uh, which was um, more tall and narrow than, than the P3. So the geometry goes to what the P5 and the new P3 um, have been using, which fits probably 90% of the people um, quite a bit better. But um, it's just uh, your entry-level um, price point carbon bike with 105 components. I think they're going to sell a ton of them. Um, you know, not the color, uh, I'm not crazy about it, but, you know, I, I think they're trying to honor the, uh, the original P2, which was, um, blue as well, or had a little bit of blue. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you've had a chance to, uh, to see it. Um, but, uh, yeah, they're going to sell a lot of them. Yeah, I actually like the looks of it quite a bit. And, uh, the question I have for you is someone with a lot of, uh, retail, uh, experience and, and someone that's you know intimately familiar with you know the, the workings of the industry um, as someone that's you know worked in retail wh how do people perceive this uh, do they do they move more p2s than p5s I, I have no idea what the number I know p5 five is much more money but you know for a retailer is this bike important yeah I mean the the pool of people that, that can spend ten thousand dollars in a bike is is not nearly as big as as those that are looking to get into the sport or trying to upgrade from just a road bike to a tri bike. So twenty eight hundred dollar price point is going to be a lot more manageable um, for a retailer to not only have multiple size runs of, but also to sell to the average customer. I I mean even if you've got millions of dollars in the bank, you're not necessarily going to want to spend $10,000 on, on your first tri bike or, or even just a, a, an upgrade. Um, you know, there's the old, um, I've got $5,000, what, what do I do? Uh, what kind of bike do I get? Do I get a, a sweet bike with okay components and, and just uh, regular wheels or do I get a P2 for $2,800 and, and upgrade to, you know, a power meter and, and get some sweet wheels. You know, there, there's there's lots of ways to skin the cat, and um, I think it gives the retailer uh, some versatility, but but it appeals to a, a wider range of people than than the P5. I mean, quite honestly, from the price point. Yeah, it's it's pretty pretty cool to see that you know, for an entry level bike, is is better or faster than you know anything really that was on the market ten years ago. Um, so. Yeah, it, it, and it's crazy to see the technology, and you see it with, with a lot of different companies. I mean, Feld's got probably the the widest range of, of traff on offerings. I mean, I, I think it, they have maybe a little bit too much. You know, you've got this sweet spot between not enough options and too many options, and I think they're on the spectrum of maybe having too many options. Um, but um, you, you look at something like the new P2 with, with 105 components, which 105 nowadays is fantastic. Um, for $2,800, where it would have been unheard of to have a carbon bike uh, for $2,800 when, when the first P, P2 came out, um, even with 105 components, quite honestly, I, I think. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's, it's just a, a sign of the times and, and technology and, and how quickly things move and evolve. Um, but uh, for somebody looking for a, for a great bike and not looking to break the bank, I mean, that's just going to be one of the bikes that you have to look at. Yeah, so you can get a, you know, a, 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 an awesome bike and still leave a junior's uh, college fund intact. So that's kind of the, the, the condensed you know, version of that. So anyways, um, what else do we have left to talk about here? Uh, we wanted to mention briefly, you know, racing, like we said, is starting to heat up, um, at least in the southern hemisphere. Um, we had Auckland 70.3. 
um, which if, if, if anybody knows that this was actually some, we had some pretty big names uh, on the women's side. Uh, Katriona Morrison won that race uh, over Annabelle Luxford, who had a fantastic race at uh, Las Vegas, uh, 70.3 last year. I believe Annabelle got second there last year. Um, I, I don't know if she's in top form right now, but Katrina Morrison uh, caught her right towards the end of that race. Um, the men's side uh, was much more stacked. Um, just looking at the results from that, uh, you know, you have you know multiple Olympic medalists that were in that race uh, from Jan Frodeno, gold medalist in Beijing. Uh, you had Bevan Doherty, um, but Richie Cunningham snuck in for second there, uh, just squeaking by uh, Terenzo Bizzoni, and then um, you know Bevan Doherty in fourth, Tim Reed in fifth. So yeah, awesome. that, that, lots of uh, lots of big big names uh, in an early season race. Um, you know, I I was commenting to you earlier that I really like Jan Frodeno. I, I think he's going to do real well, and, and um, you know, he, he should have won. I think it was Wiesbaden last year where he couldn't find his transition bag or, or, or the volunteers misplaced it. And, um, even after running a 108, he finished second. Um, but, um, yeah, I, the, the other race that was on the uh, on the schedule was uh, Challenge, I don't know how you say it, Wanaka? Is that Wanaka, how you say it? exactly, yeah, Wanaka. Um, which didn't have a, didn't get as much attention, um, but uh, a, a race that's um, that um, you know that, that had a, a professional field, and um, that one was um, let's see who, who won that one. Um, Dylan McNeese. Do you know uh, Dylan McNeese by chance? Oh yeah, I went to high school with him. <laughs> uh, and Candace Hammond from, uh, from both from New Zealand. So. Um, Definitely not as, as high profile of a race, and I, I think at this time of the year, a full race is probably not going to have the, the type of, of competition that, that a, a half will. Uh, I don't, I just don't think people's fitness levels are at that point, um, and um, and you know it's so so you're probably not going to get as strong of a field. But that was another one of the races, um, Challenge Monica, um, and then of course coming up, um, not so far in, in the in the future, we've we've got uh, Oceanside, uh, which is a couple months away, and, and Melbourne, um, even a, a little bit later than that. But that's just when the schedule really starts heating up. Yeah, well, we're starting to see some people starting to maybe uh, test their fitness, maybe get some uh, you know race workouts in. And uh, you know, I saw Michelle Bremer from New Zealand is kind of on her way back. She got fourth at Auckland, so it was nice to see her uh, kind of coming back into the racing scene. And uh, you know, I think people are starting to kind of you know, get their, their race legs, at least in the Southern, the southern Hemisphere. Yes, and uh, we shall see how, um, yeah, how the racing season starts to uh, to heat up and, and develop. Okay, well, I think that about does it for us. Our time's just about up for this week's broadcast, but uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in to This Week in Try, and uh, as always, we invite you to join the conversation uh, by visiting us at thisweekintry.com and our Facebook, facebook.com forward slash thisweekintriathlon. And uh, until, we, uh, until next week, uh, train hard and stay safe. Absolutely. Always a pleasure, Kevin, and uh, we'll see you next time. All right. See you, Andreas. Thanks.